Hi, I'm Doug Hayhoe, and I've written a series of short video essays and podcasts on science, faith, and other topics. Most of the videos relate to one of God's two books, Nature or Scripture. This video is about Blaise Pascal, his science, and his faith. Pascal was a scientific and mathematical genius, but his theological insights were even greater. I'm going to begin with a simple mathematical pattern. In grade 9, I became fascinated with numbers, and I happened upon Pascal's triangle. Here's Pascal's triangle. You start with a 1 at the top, then the second line down from the top, you, have, you add another 1, so you have a 1 and a 1. And then the third line, though, you have a 1, 2, 1. You get a 2 in the middle because it has two ones above it, one to the upper left and one to the upper right, whereas the two ones only have one one above it. The fourth line, 1, 3, 3, 1. There's a 1, and then the 3 is the addition of the 1 and the 2 above the 3. And the next 3 is the addition of the 2 and the 1 above it, and then you get a 1. So each time you go down, you add the two numbers above a number, and you get that number. Very beautiful, simple pattern, Pascal's triangle. This simple arrangement describes many useful patterns, it turns out, in mathematics. Take the binomial theorem, for example. You probably remember that x plus y quantity squared equals x squared plus 2xy plus y squared. You can also write it this way. x plus y squared equals 1x squared. The 1 was understood to be there, plus 2xy plus 1y squared. Look at the components. 1, 2, 1, the numerical components. Where do they come from? Pascal's triangle, third row down, 1, 2, 1. Now, let's look at x plus y to the sixth. That would take a lot of calculations to figure that one out, multiplying x plus y by itself six times. What is it equal to? Well, just figuring out the x's and the y's is pretty straightforward. So each of those terms, the two exponents have to add up to six. So you start with x to the sixth, and then x to the fifth plus y to the one, they add up to six, then plus x to the fourth plus y squared, plus x to the cubed plus y cubed, plus x squared plus y to the fourth, and so on. But this isn't quite right because it's missing the numerical components. So where do we get them from? Well, for the x plus y squared above, we went to the third row of Pascal's triangle. So for x plus y to the sixth, we go to the seventh row of Pascal's triangle. So the seventh row, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, takes us down to the second from the bottom. One, six, 15, 20, 15, six, one. Those are the components, the numerical components. So what we get is that x plus y to the sixth equals one x to the sixth plus six, x fifth y one, plus 15, x four y two, plus 20, x cubed y3 plus 16, and so on. So those numbers are just that second bottom row, 1, 6, 15, 20, 15, 6, 1. Pascal's triangle, in fact, was discovered long before Pascal, but he included it in his posthumous treatise on arithmetic triangle. And so it was named in Europe after Pascal, and it certainly expresses his mindset. Now let me give you a simple definition of mathematics in six words, something I didn't learn until later in life. Here it is. Mathematics is the science of patterns. Six words. Mathematics is not a lot of calculations and adding and subtracting. Really, that's not math. Mathematics is the science of patterns. That really broadens what mathematics is about. You can't get any simpler than this. And so Pascal's triangle is really just a simple pattern. Pascal's triangle may not have been anything new. He didn't discover it. So what unique thing did Pascal do? Well, in 1639, when he was just 16 years old, Pascal did prove something completely new in projective geometry and conics. It had never been done before. And even though the study of conics began with the Greeks, let me, the Greeks, let me show you how this works. So here we have a circle. And inside the circle, you see the circle there in the middle, we've inscribed six sides by having six terminals. We got A, B, C, D, E, and F. 
And that gives us six sides. AB is one side, then BC down the left, CD, DE, EF, and FA. What Pascal showed was take any two opposite sides. Let's take AF. And what's opposite to AF is CD. Opposite means there's two sides between them on both sides. And extend those. Extend AF to the left and extend CD up to the left and they meet at N. You get a point. Now, there are two other combinations of opposite sides. For example, you can do FE and BC. They meet up at the top at point P. And then finally, you can get DE and that meets with AB down at the way bottom left as point M. So if you extend the three sets of opposite sides to get three points, P, N, and M, Pascal proved that those three points will lie in a straight line. On the right here, you have a point I that doesn't lie in a straight line because the two sides that are extended are not opposite sides. There's a geometry software package that's free in Ontario schools called Geometer Sketchpad. A friend and math science educator colleague of mine, Andrew Nunn, has used the Geometer Sketchpad to prove Pascal's theorem for all different conics, not just the circle, as I showed you. This includes the ellipse, parabola, and hyperbola. I've included these diagrams in the appendix, and I'll just show them briefly here uh, to show you how that works, and I won't take time to explain them. So here's the ellipse. You do the same thing. You engrave six points in the ellipse, extend the sides, and you get three points that all meet in one line. The points where they meet hasn't been labeled, but you can see that blue line that goes from the top left to the bottom right goes through three points, the ellipse. There's a hyperbola. A bit trickier to see the brown hyperbola. Do the same thing as Pascal proved. Quite amazing. And then finally, the parabola. Six points and you extend opposite sides that are separated each by two sides. And they, they intercept in three points that lie in a plane. So Pascal proved this geometry theorem when he was just 16. A few years later, when Pascal was 19, he showed his genius in technology. To help his father with tedious calculations in the tax department where he worked, he invented the first mechanical calculator, later called a Pascaline. So here it is, it's in the library in Paris, museum in Paris, Pascal's calculating machine. It can be called the first computer, actually. In honor of this first computer, or first calculating machine, the renowned Swiss computer scientist, Nicholas Wirth, called the computer language that he invented, Pascal. It was in operation on university campuses until 1970, or after 1970. And some of you may have learned this computer language in your own studies. Pascal's greatest scientific discovery was about atmospheric pressure. That was made when he was 25. He reasoned that the atmospheric pressure on us is due to the weight of air in the atmosphere above us. While he may not have been the first to realize this, he was the first to measure it scientifically and prove it. Here's what he did. He proposed climbing a mountain, measuring atmospheric pressure at the bottom of the mountain and again at the top. Since his own health was not good, however, he used a relative. For the experiment, Pascal's brother-in-law had to carefully pour the liquid mercury into a bowl and place four-foot glass tubes in the mercury to measure the height at different points. It worked. Pascal's experiment soon became a model of carefully controlled scientific investigation that has been followed for almost four centuries. In recognition of Pascal's groundbreaking work, a unit of atmospheric pressure in the metric system is called a Pascal. So standard atmospheric pressure on Earth is 101,000 pascals, or 14.7 pounds per square inch. You may remember that, the old units that I grew up with. The atmospheric pressure where you live, however, probably varies from day to day as the weather goes through its highs and lows. These changes in the atmosphere, unfortunately, cause headaches for some people, like for my wife. After his groundbreaking work on pressure, Pascal was not finished with mathematics. During a spiritual low in his life, when he hung out with gamblers, one of them asked for help in solving a problem. 
How do you fairly divide the stakes if the game is stopped midway through? Pascal worked out the answer with another math genius at the same time, Pierre de Fermat. This collaboration between Pascal and Fermat led to the foundation of probability theory. More details about Pascal's life you can find on Wikipedia. What about Pascal's faith, however? Although, like most others in France at that time, Pascal was brought up in the Catholic faith, it didn't have much impact on him in his early days. In 1646, however, he experienced what he called a first conversion. He had come into contact with a splinter group called Jansenists. They largely followed the theology of Augustine, who emphasized the key role of grace in salvation. You can see my essay, The Legacy of St. Augustine, for more details. After this, however, Pascal fell away and became friends with a more worldly group of libertines. And it was during that time, as I mentioned above, that he thought more about probability in connection with gambling outcomes. But in 1654, Pascal had a profound second conversion, which seared itself on his heart for the rest of his life. So here's a painting of him, public domain, Blaise Pascal. He died when he was quite young, as we're going to see. During his second conversion, Pascal had a deep encounter with Christ. To describe it, he later wrote this, Fire, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, not of the philosophers and the scholars, God of Jesus Christ. And then he ended it with Psalm 119, verse 6, I will not forget thy word. Eight years later, when Pascal died, these words were found written on the inside of his jacket. After his second conversion, Pascal dedicated his time to defending his spiritual beliefs. In addition to being a skilled mathematician and physicist, he was also a great writer. Two main books carrying his succinct and witty sayings are readily available on the web. In his anonymous provincial letters, Pascal attacked bad religion's arguments such as casuistry, the mere use of complex reasoning to justify moral laxity. He also weighed in on scientific matters such as Galileo's support of a sun-centered solar system. This new, new view of Galileo proposed that Earth rotates daily on its axes and revolves yearly around the sun. For us moderns, it's difficult to imagine anything more obvious than that. But many in the early 1600s, especially church leaders, clung to the old geocentric model that Earth stood still, while sun, moon, and stars revolved daily around Earth. For one thing, this kept mankind at the physical center of the universe. In his letters, provincial letters, Pascal's argument to the church leaders in Rome went something like this, quote, Imprisoning Galileo will never prove that Earth remains stationary. In fact, if it can be proved by scientific observation that Earth and not the sun rotates daily, the arguments of all mankind together will not keep Earth from rotating daily carrying all of you religious leaders rotating with it. That's a paraphrase, but quite sarcastic, as you can see. Christians today who support conspiracy theories that go against obvious scientific facts would do well to pay attention to Pascal's argument. Pascal was a man of deep faith, but he realized that it makes no sense to oppose widely established scientific facts, such as Earth rotating daily on its axes and revolving yearly around the sun. But Pascal wasn't all in with logical reasoning. In fact, he opposed natural theology, the idea that we can learn about God sufficiently from observation and reason. This is especially apparent in his second book called Pensées, or Thoughts. This book, Pensées, was to be Pascal's masterpiece, his great defense of the Christian faith. Unfortunately, however, Pascal died at the early age of 39 before he could complete his second book, Pensées. But after his death, his ideas, statements, and many pithy sayings on scraps of paper prepared for this book were collected and published. It has since been hailed as one of the greatest prose works of the French language. Here are some of Pascal's carefully composed and thought out statements. It is not certain that everything is uncertain. That's beautiful. If God does not exist, one will lose nothing by believing in him. But if he does exist, one will lose everything by not believing in him. That's called Pascal's wager. Third one, man is equally incapable of seeing the nothingness from which he emerges and the infinity in which he is engulfed. 
And then, the supreme function of reason is to show us that some things are beyond reason. Of course, he wrote these in French, and it sounds just as great in French, great in English as it does in French. Some more. The heart has its own reason, which reason does not know. Again, punning on the word reason. There is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of each man which cannot be satisfied by any created thing, but only by God the Creator made known through Jesus Christ. So amazing that the scientist who discovered atmospheric pressure would actually write about a vacuum. In order to humiliate that superb power of reasoning, human reasoning, which claims it must judge of the things which the will chooses, God wished that these things enter from the heart to the mind and not from the mind to the heart. Beautiful statement. He also composed longer statements or paragraphs. Here's one. Man is but a reed, the weakest thing in nature, but he is a thinking reed. It is not required that the entire universe arm itself to crush him. A vapor, a drop of water suffices to kill him. But if the universe crushed him, man would still be more novel than that which kills him because he knows he is dying and he knows the advantage that the universe has over him of which the universe knows nothing. In the title to his biography, Neither Angel Nor Beast, The Life and Work of Blaise Pascal by Francis X.J. Coleman, he quotes Pascal's own reflections on what humans are, neither angels nor beasts, as we've seen. Coleman then begins his biography by saying this, Pascal was a mathematician, a physicist, an inventor, a theologian, a philosopher, and the greatest prose stylist in the French language. In his succeeding chapters, Coleman develops and comments on each of these characteristics in detail. For me, it suffices to say this, Pascal is another great example of someone who believed fully in God's two books, the book of nature and the book of scripture. But he went further than this. When he realized that his unique ability to investigate both mathematics and nature didn't satisfy the deepest core of his heart, Pascal welcomed Jesus Christ into his life on the deepest level, and he never regretted it. Thank you.